get an outdoor cat. All right, ladies, good luck when you're ready. All right, so good morning, guys. Um, my name is Millie, this is Chloe, Hello. this is Sophia, and sadly, Ashley isn't with us today, but today we'll be teaching you about collaborative learning. Uh, the learning intentions for today. By the end of this lesson, you guys will be able to <coughs> define what collaborative learning is. You will understand the effectiveness of collaborative learning within a classroom, and you will know specific learning strategies to implement collaborative learning within a classroom. Chloe is going to be talking about what collaborative learning is. So what is collaborative learning? Collaborative learning is from the foundation of the zone of proximity development. Vygotsky's emphasized the significance of learning via conversation and interactions with other children and through all of them isolated work in this zone of proximity development, sorry. The collaborative learning is a notion of groups learning that created room for this. Vygotsky was particularly concerned about how children interpret tough times and problems through social interactions brought by significant shifts in their physical, mental and social developments. In contrast, a measure of the independent performance, Vygotsky maintained the evaluating a child's capacity for learning through approach of collaborative engagement was a stronger indicator for their future cognitive function. Their learning, um, developing physiological functions are seen as indicators of the learner's collaborative or help performance. It is because of the child's function, collaborative function, which gives them the capacity to gain most of the assistance being provided by other children. They may benefit from the, the joint treatments. Collaborative learning is a physical, is a, sorry, is a pedagogical theory or method that promotes or involves using groups <coughs> from loosely structured systems or dividing lower elementary classrooms into teams of students who loosely, whose pro progress is regularly charted to highly structured systems for teaching close observation setups. Collaborative learning is a phrase that is used to describe a range of classroom activities which is defined as learning, which occurs in a stable, formal group of two or more students who collaborate and share the workload fairly as they advance toward the measured outcomes. Collaborative learning is characteristic as ongoing, coordinated effort to develop a joint issue space of shared representations of the problem to be solved as opposed to collabor collaborating, coordinated and collective activities. Teachers have made the effort to incorporate various sorts of activities that involve collaboration in their lesson plans in order to accomplish this goal. All right, so the next part is Ashley's part and I'll be saying Ashley's part for today. So uh, she was going to talk about the types of collaborative learning and how to implement them in a classroom and how to differentiate and include a wide range of learners. So the first type of um, collaborative learning that you could do is think, pair, share. Think, pair, shares are where learners reflect independently, then form pairs and discuss. Um, some pairs will then share, discuss their responses with the class. The next is the snowball learning technique, which helps students share and teach each other concepts and topics. Learners first share their knowledge in pairs and then combine with one another to become a group of four. They then combine with another group of four to become a group of eight. Students gradually build upon their knowledge and widen their perspectives by combining with other groups. Uh, the next is group investigation. Now, group investigation involves groups getting allocated a topic, theme, or problem, which they then investigate based on a series of questions. They then combine findings to present a whole class through form of PowerPoint, posters, brochures, etc. The next is group investigation. Uh, oh, the next is jigsaw <laughs> strategy. Uh, the jigsaw strategy allows a group of students to become experts in a specific topic. Individuals are then regrouped and they all share their expertise with their new group members. This strategy offers a way to help students ensure they understand the topic and retain information while developing their interpersonal skills. Uh, the next is the six thinking hats. 
Now, Six Thinking Hats is a collaborative teaching strategy whereby students are in groups of six and they each take on a different coloured um, thinking hat. Each colour has different perspectives and thinking styles that they have to do. Uh, the following perspectives are included. So the white hat are facts, figures and objective information. The red hat is emotions, feelings, hunches and intuition. The black hat focuses on putting the caution points on the thinkers. It also critically assesses the weaknesses of an idea and also the reasons why something will not work. The yellow hat focuses on the positive aspects of why something will work. The green hat focuses on creativity, generating new ideas, provoking thoughts. And the blue hat controls the, all the other hats, thinking about thinking processes, direct attention to other hats and facilitating the thinking. Six Thinking Hats as a strategy allows students to look at the topic and problem from all different aspects and then share this. It develops critical thinking skills. Now, I will be talking about the, um, how effective collaborative learning is. But how do we know if collaborative learning is effective within a classroom? So according to Churchill, collaborative learning has been extensively researched throughout all disciplines. Its benefits are documented by various theorists. Um, Marzano and Hattie both agree that the use of collaborative learning groups adds value to whole class instruction and to individual work. While Johnson and Johnson claim that collaborative learning groups foster socialization. Johnson and Johnson also state that when used properly, collaborative learning is a great tool in enabling the benefits of less able students to read to receive instructions from the more able students. But how effective is it? So collaborative learning can be extremely effective in a classroom, but only if it is done well. According to Woods and Chen, there are five conditions that must be met for more productive and successful collaborative learning experiences. So students must know these um, you know, five conditions well before they can work effectively in a collaborative group. So the first one is positive inter interdependence, where team members should rely on each other to reach the same goal. Students need to believe that they are linked together and that they all succeed together. They need to understand that if anyone fails to do their part, everyone suffers the consequences. And I'm sure you all understand this. Promotive interaction. So students help and encourage each other to learn. Students must understand how to provide each other with feedback challenging conclusions and reasoning. And most importantly, teaching and encouraging each other. Individual and group accountability. All students in a, in a group must know how to be accountable. So they are accountable for their shared work and for all materials to be learned. Students must understand and be encouraged to practice trust building, leaderships, decision making, communication and skill management. Group processing. Students should know how to set group goals, assess what they are doing as a team, and identify the changes that should be made in the future. As you can see, it is extremely important for students to understand how to work collaboratively before they can do so effectively. I am sure many of you agree that working collaboratively can be difficult and sometimes annoying when you guys hear that you've got to do a group assignment, I'm sure everyone moans and groans because you've had that one bad experience and that one bad experience can really deter you from wanting to do group work. That's the same as children. So if a child has a bad experience in group work, they will never want to do it. So, not that they'll never want to do it, but you know, like it's going to be hard for them to want to do it. So it's, as a teacher, you really need to set those foundations and help the children overcome you know, those difficulties. When it is done effectively, collaborative learning leads to high achievement and more productivity, more caring, supportive and committed relationships and greater psychological health, social confidence and self-esteem. In education, collaboration has been the most effective teaching instruction to promote students for greater number of learners. Collaborative learning can also help establish a social support system for learners, a positive atmosphere for modelling and practising cooperation, enhancing learners' self-esteem, diminishing anxiety, and involving learners actively. The impact of collaborative learning approaches um, is consistently, consistently positive, with students, students making an additional five months progress 
on average over the course of an academic year, and that is amazing. The evidence indicates that groups of three to five are most effective for collaborative learning approaches. These are the smaller impacts for both paired work and collaborative learning activities with more than five in a group. Perfect, so now onto my part, just go back a bit. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to get the room's opinion about, so the girls have set the pre, like the pretext kind of context for what collaborative learning is. I just wanted to get your opinion about what negatives or challenges you may have come across as a teacher, or you think you may come across with assist, um, with um, offering collaborative learning in a classroom. So just put your hands up, ask some questions, yeah. Yeah, you might have like one kid doing the work, but the rest are uh, budging. Yeah, mm -hmm. perfect. You may have like one kid that takes the lead. Awesome. Yeah. I have kids that don't get along, like playground setting, don't get along, and then put them together in a classroom. Yeah. yeah, that's going to create some conflict there you as really, well. As a teacher, you really need to know your students, so you need to know who to put together so they can work together effectively. Perfect. Were there any more? Any more? All right, awesome. So if you go back onto my slides, um, some of the things that I've um, researched and some challenges that we may come across, click again. <laughs> That's okay. It should show you into some challenges. So we have this idea of social loafers. So they, um, they have the tendency to go off topic in classrooms. So it's understanding and establishing who's going to be a social loafer and kind of isolating those in within groups. Um, students may also take control, like um, we had in the class. There's also, also conflict in group dynamics. Time management and distractions are things that you may come across. So ensuring that we manage time and those distractions, as well as noise levels. It can get really high and then another group's going to go off topic. Um, we also have like different students learn at different paces as well. So um, it's important to keep that in mind when you're grouping. Um, we also have students that may not have the right skills established to do a task effectively in collaborative learning. Um, it's also ensuring that students may be reluctant and we also have this other issue of inverted, the inverted struggle. So those that are more introverted learners may be reluctant to participate in classwork and in group work. And it's also important that when you're doing an assessment or assess, like you're trying to assess the ability of a child within the classroom, you may come across those that have individual accountability, um, like making sure that you're marking fairly across these groups as well, and the contributions made by different group members are considered. So these are all like challenges that we may come across. Um, it's also important that students, so just to repeat, they have enough um, mastery and competence, like um, what Millie said, and that they're actively engaging, so you ensure that these have been set before. Um, also, um, something that I came across in my research was understanding about language issues that, teach, uh, that students may face in a group, and it's called heterogeneics. And it's also understanding the cultural differences that bridge different students as well in a classroom because as, a, as living and working in Australia, we're all multicultural. So if you set a group task that may be historical or a group task that's English, different students are going to offer different things as well and contribute differently to a classroom. So it's important to keep um, their cultural background as well, um, diversity and the different perspectives that students are going to bring to these collaborative learning tasks. Um, if you go just to the next one, we're looking at different strategies and adaptabilities um, in the group. I'm not going to go through them all, but I've got them just up on the slide as well. So that's important for ELD students as well, that tasks are delegated accordingly. Um, that the right goals and clarifying these individual roles is really important. Um, so for bigger tasks as well, Millie heard us um, focused on the fact that if the groups are bigger than five or four, students may get lost in this group work. So it's important to warn students about it being time consuming, that you've set a time frame for the task to be done as well. So it's not like they just, this is free time for the students in class to just, you know, sit and have a chat. Um, that's recess time, but you've actually set time for um, the task as well. Um, and that's where also um, think pair share comes in handy as well. So students that are anxious and we have students that struggle with the, in, the um, introverted struggle, they're also like more confident with the students that aren't so confident um, and they encourage them to participate and that learning is being facilitated across um, all of your learning at collaborative activity and it also gives them the encouragement to then share with the rest of the class if they had a really good um, idea. So it's ensuring that it's creating a positive learning environment for everyone as well. 
Um, just another thing as well is um, open to communication. So everyone's communication styles are different, so they need to be clear and open for all students. So if we go on to the next part, we've got our activity. All right, good morning, Year 6. Today we are going to follow on from our previous history lesson about the 1967 referendum. We are going to start off by reading this book, Say Yes, a story of friendship, fairness, and a vote for hope. When we are reading this book, I want you all to think about how you will feel if you were Mandy. Okay. So everyone should be listening as after this we'll be getting into groups and you guys will be writing a few things about the story. On a hot, hot day, the sun smacks us on the head and the footpath burns like a fry pan. Mandy and me can hear the kids in the pool screaming, happy and splashing, all that beautiful cool water. But the pool man says no, Mandy's not allowed in, that's the law. Mandy's grandma is sick. She needs a visit. Mandy's mum packs the suitcase for a long journey. I go to the station to wave goodbye and blow kisses. But the train officer says, no, you have to ask permission. It's the law. Me and Mandy know the alphabet. Her big brother Simon showed us the letters. We're going to be the smartest kids at school we're going to sit next to each other every day on the smooth wooden benches. But the teacher says no, she has to go to another school. It's the law. Mr Wallowicz gave us money for the cinema because we tidied up his garden. The film was, has music, our favourite kind. There's enough left over for popcorn too, as long as we share. But the ticket girl says no, you can't both sit there. It's the law. It's the law, but that's not fair. It's just not fair. Mandy's mum says there are two ladies. There's Mrs. Jessie Street and Mrs. Faith Bandler. They are clever and they have strong, clear voices. They are writing down new laws. They are making speeches everywhere. It's not fair about the pools and the schools and the cinema, they say. It's just not fair. It's not fair to have to ask permission to go and see your grandma. It's just not fair. So what do we do? We can change that law, says Mrs. Jessie Street. And how do we do it? We vote yes, says Mrs. Faith Bandler. Vote yes, vote yes. May 27 is voting day. Everybody in the district comes to the town hall. Me and Mandy wear our badges that will answer yes or no. When we count up all the votes, the answer is yes, 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 yes. May 27 is a good day. Mandy's mum buys all us kids ice cream cones chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. It's just a beginning, she says. A good beginning. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. All right, so now we are going to get in groups of three or four. Um, we are going to divide you guys up um, and you guys will all get a question. We've got a link to a Padlet where you will answer the questions on there as a group, remembering we need to work together as a team, okay? So we'll be coming around, making sure you're all working with each other. We'll give you a few extra questions to help you guys um, answer in depth. Um, you guys will be given around 10 minutes. Yeah, we're gonna try and cap it about five to 10 minutes. So make sure that topic is, um, discussion is on topic. And if you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask. It is important to consider the different aspects of the question and it may get a bit confusing. So that's why we're willing um, to help and it's important to have open discussion. So I'm just gonna come around and hand out a few of those questions for you guys. All right, so you four, group one. You four here. You four, group two. You four, uh, I think you're you four, can be group three. You four, can be group five. You can be group six. 
um, who was the Minister of Australia at the time, and he um, petitioned for the bill to go through. And just something on the Constitution um, is that it was in favour, so the percentage of voters was 90.77% 90, 90 of Australians voted for this constitution to go through. Um, and it also was under the constitution changed and it was to make laws for peace, order and good in the government. So that was um, how it was passed. So just a fun fact, because um, we had a few questions over here and I didn't know, like wanted everyone in the class to know about that as well. So. All right, so we're just going to go through some of the answers. So group one had the question, how do you think racism came about? How did we as a country overcome racism and begin to accept the Aboriginals? So, uh, you guys said a new colour of skin was very new and unfamiliar. That is a great point. Um, we think racism came about when the British shelters came into Australia. They had never seen the different skin colour. We haven't. We haven't. It's still working in progress. However, laws have changed the inclusion of Indigenous rights. That could start a big discussion. We're just saying that it could be more, but we're still working on it. Yep. All right, group two, do um, you want to read out your question? Yeah. Do you think the narrator would be less empathetic if she wasn't so close to Mandy? What did you guys think? So we believe that the narrator would actually be less empathetic because we believe she was able to be so empathetic due to having similar experiences as well as using Mandy, the character, as a representation of her feelings. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we believe if she didn't have that experience, she wouldn't have that empathetic understanding. There would be no changes. There would be no story to deliver. Yeah. You know, no motivation to drive yeah. her to write that story. Yeah. So we do believe that she would be less empathetic. Great point. All right, group four, do you want to read out your question and your points? Okay, so people do not view justice. No, there's not that. Okay. It is not. It is just not fair. Is a repeated line in this text, what constitutes fairness and justice? Do people always view fairness in the same way? Think, for example, of the differences of opinion between different political parties or different cultures or religions. So we've said that people do not view, um, view justice in the same way. Some people view justice from like a religious perspective where it's like, you know, um, justice is God, but God will serve justice. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people are more concerned with justice and fairness on earth through like the law and social activism. And right and wrong is not necessarily this um, objective concept when considering the different cultures, religions, and values of all individuals. So justice can't possibly be viewed the same way as everyone. Perfect, good job. Guys, does anyone have anything to add to that? No. All right, group five, can you read out your question and your answers? Um, imagine having to sit in a special part of the cinema or not being allowed to swim at the public swimming pool or seek government permission to travel interstate to attend a relative's funeral. How would you feel? So we said we would feel upset, discriminated against, feeling like you can't live your own life, feeling like it's unfair and maybe a bit deflated as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we also wanted to think about like how, so obviously Mandy's friend is not Aboriginal. How do you think she overcame, you know, She's got a friend that can't come to all the amazing things that she gets to go do. How do you think she overcame the prejudices and didn't just fall into line with everyone else and go, oh, she can't come do this with me. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave her. Like instead she stayed with her, kept her as a friend, didn't fall into everyone else's way of thinking. Way of thinking. How do you guys think um, Mandy's friend overcame that? I think maybe her parents weren't, What's it, yeah, racist or whatever, yeah. didn't teach her about, um, or maybe taught them why that's the case and how it's not fair. Yeah. But, yeah. How so do you she, think she felt as well? Like, how do you think Mandy's friend felt? Maybe segregated as well, maybe? Yeah. Mm. That's, it's actually important to note as well, those that were friends with Aboriginals before the referendum came through, Australia's First Peoples, they also faced a bit of prejudice and racism as well. It was a flow on effect that happened throughout the community and it can be seen through the different activities and things that were presented in the book. So that's a really good point. All right, and group six, do you want to read out your question and your answers? Um, well, we said, so do you still see such prejudices in your own communities? So we said that, um, yeah, it still exists. Some of it isn't as as obvious. Yeah, as like <laughs> it's it was, a yeah. Life, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But 
yeah, so there's still many Indigenous people fighting for rights and laws and all that. Um, people with attitudes to different races, and not just Indigenous people. Um, and then there's like protests for all different issues that are happening, like abortion, all that kind of stuff, like that's yeah. going on. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. And that's also like the point of what Rita was saying about justice and how we view justice very differently and how there are different things that people are fighting for when it comes to justice and it can be based on a cultural or racial level. That's really good. Awesome. Right. So thank you guys for um, being a part of this activity. I think it's just from going back to our presentation side of things. Um, it's important to acknowledge different cross-curriculum KLA areas that we um, presented throughout our activity and class as well. Um, that was based as an English lesson, but we history, also English. History, history English lesson lesson. But we also tried to add in the cross-curriculum area of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, um, as well as um, history and English together. Understanding um, the repetitiveness of it's not fair, the language that was used in the book to emphasise different aspects. Um, so it's something that you can really use when doing collaborative learning and incorporate into your classrooms as well as understanding different levels of challenges that you're going to face and strategies that you can adapt and use within the classroom. Yeah. How do you guys think you went in the like collaborative learning groups? Do you think um, this would be an effective strategy within the classroom? Do you think you guys would use it? Most definitely. Mm -hmm. I found yeah. that it was like really helpful to add to other people's ideas because I was when I first read the question, I was like, oh, what do we all think? Like, yeah. What do I think? And then we all kind of influence each other's choices mm. and decisions and it yeah. really helps. I know I find it so much more helpful to learn and understand a question when I'm bouncing off someone else, yes. like same yeah. thing, you're thinking out it and you're like, what is going on? Yeah. But then as soon as you talk to someone or spit out your ideas, it all just like comes to you. Yeah. And that's the same with students. But then again, you also do need to think about the anxious students, you wouldn't just straight out pop them in a group and just be like you're you're in a group you may be like even in the morning just go go up to them and go all right guys um just letting you know today we're going to go in a group so um that's coming up after lunch time just to settle them in and then not just surprised and wow about it um did you have something yeah i feel like at our point in our learning as in us as however old we are kind of learning works without being regulated like even if you guys yep. didn't pull up you'll fine like with kids, they just be hey go on. So they yes. need to be regulated in terms of what's being discussed. Is everyone being treated fairly? So I feel like yeah, I think they need to regulate it more. It's very it's funny you say that because like I'm a high school teacher, like I'm training to be a high school teacher and the girls are training to be primary school teachers. So for me and my adaptability um with group collaboration, so I wanted to ask your opinions first. It was much more of like Let's see what the classroom knows, because I know that you are very independent learners by the time you get to high school, and it's less that. But also ensuring that collaboratively, the le collaborative learning can be adapted, um, and that you know didn't need to come around to the classes in case people have questions. But it's still important to regulate that learning and ensure that it's happening. Because when I just a personal experience from Prac, it was really important that I monitored the boy because I went to an all boys school that I monitored the boys and just like were circling the classroom because they would change their computer screens. And the Prac teacher did notice that she said it in so she goes the boys were like really scared that you were coming up not scared but like they were more on task when you were there and just floating around socially because they were they're the type to just get off topic really quickly um so you may not have to interfere or actually ask questions but just your present makes them presence makes them know that you're um, ensuring that that group work and collaboration is being facilitated so that's an awesome point we're talking yeah. heaps about like what the students need to do for collaborative learning to be effective yeah. but it's also what we need to do as a teacher like it is so important for us to know our students, to know who to pair them with, you know, to know who's going to be off topic. So you know that you're going to go straight to that group and be like, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> Speed off, like, you know, give us some ideas of what you're going to talk about so that they know, oh my gosh, the teacher's focused in on us. We really got to do this. You know, you know the students that you can leave till last because you know they're going to get it done. Um, you also need to know 
you know, yeah, different AIL, levels. Yeah, AILD yeah. learners, um, different levels. Like, well, is that it can be more advanced, so you're actually prompting them to be challenged in tasks. So if you set tasks that are a bit more base level and they're showing a higher level of learning, it's important that you're also challenging them in their class and facilitating them their learning as well. Yep. Yeah. All right, so back to our learning intentions. Do you guys think that um, you will now be able to define what collaborative learning is? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you guys understand the effectiveness of collaborative learning within a classroom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, do you know the specific learning strategies to implement collaborative learning within a classroom? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, and well done. Well done.